have a wonderful blessed week. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. It's good to see you all again. Glad you all came out, even with it being cold and rainy. One thing is for sure, is if you're a meteorologist, you have a pretty good job because you can be wrong 90% of the time and keep your job. But if you're wrong 90% of the time doing anything else, especially as a machinist as I myself was before becoming a missionary, I wouldn't have a job that long, that's for sure. So, our title today about our message is, Does Jesus Really Care? And, you know, we all are facing difficulties and hardships and trials in our lives. And sometimes we have a tendency to be so focused on those things that we're going through that we forget to remember that Jesus is there with us. A very good example is Job. Job went through some very trying situations, and we really see very clearly the great controversy carried out in his life. But did Job do anything to deserve what came upon him? No, of course not. And so, sometimes some of the difficulties that we face in our lives, it's not because we've done anything wrong, but it's because God sees something worth perfecting in us. And it's under the trying circumstances that the gold, the pure gold, is refined and is truly revealed. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started, okay? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day that you blessed us with. Thank you for Jesus and his willingness to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, we pray that as we take a look at this message, we pray that if any has any doubt as to whether or not you truly do care about them, that at the end of this message, that all that doubt will be removed and that we all will see without a shadow of a doubt that you do truly love us and care about us. For we ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading was found in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3. And I would like us to take a look again at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3. Because there's some very important things that Isaiah points out to us there. And it's such a reassuring promise that God has made to us. In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3. When we're all there, say amen, okay? Amen. Okay? And it says, starting with verse 1. But now this set the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So no matter what the circumstances that we're going through, no matter what the difficulties that we are facing in our lives, Jesus has promised us that he is not going to leave us alone to face these all by ourselves and be overcome and overwhelmed by the difficulties and the hardships that we are facing in this life. He promised us that he will be with us to go through these difficulties and these circumstances. But sometimes, like I was saying a while ago, we have the tendency to focus so much on the problems and so much on the difficulties that we're facing that we lose sight of Jesus and we think that he's turned his back on us or that he has forsaken us. Like for example, remember the poem, The Footprints in the Sand? It says that the person all throughout their life, they always turned back and they could see how many sets of prints in the sand. Two sets of footprints, right? And then he said, but in the most trying time of his life, he turned around and he looked and he said only one set of footprints and he questioned the Lord. He said, Lord, why? In the most darkest trying time of my life, would you leave me alone? And Jesus said, my child, I didn't leave you alone. When you turned around and you looked and seen the one set of footprints, it was because at that time I carried you. And so what we need to be doing is instead of focusing on the problems and the difficulties and the hardships and all the things and all the wickedness and the corruption that's going on in this life, if we focus on this, we'll have enough to keep us miserable and downcast and downtrodden and sad and gloomy all the time. 
Because, I mean, there's plenty of stuff out there going on in the world that can keep us so depressed and disappointed that we will lose focus of Jesus. But Jesus said, like he said to Peter, what is that to you? Follow thou me. And also, Jesus tells us to keep our focus stayed upon him. So when you see all these things happening, lift up your eyes and lift up your head for your redemption, Joel, is not. And so I want us to take a look. Now some other scriptures. But there's also some other things, too, that we need to realize. And that is, sometimes, like our friend here in this um, picture here, you notice there's four people, and all four of them have a cross to bear. We all have a cross that we must bear in this life as well, too. And we always seem to think that our cross is heavier than those that are bearing the cross before us as well, too, because we think that our problems, our difficulties, and the trials that we're going through, that they're more severe than anybody else is facing. And this guy right here, if you notice, he begins to complain about, it's too heavy, the cross is too heavy, Lord, cut it down a little bit. And so... The Lord permits him to cut it down, and it gets to the point where he keeps cutting it down because he complains about it being too heavy. And look what happens at the end. There's a ravine between the path, and his cross is too short to reach across the other way. Are we going to be like him? Are we going to be like the other three and endure and bear the cross joyfully? Because we don't have to bear the cross alone by ourselves. Jesus is here to help us to bear our crosses. Remember, in not Hebrews, but Matthew chapter 11, he said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he said, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And then Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Cast all our cares upon him, for he cares for us. And so, now let's turn our Bibles to Psalm chapter 4, and let's take a look at some wonderful passages of the Scripture that will reassure us that Jesus does really, truly care about us, and that He is concerned about even the smallest of things that we face in this life, and that He wants us to keep focusing on Him, allowing Him to bring us through these difficulties, for the purpose of his character being fully reflected in us. Because if God did not see anything worth perfecting in us, would he allow these trials and difficulties that we're facing in our lives to come upon us? Of course not. And you know another thing as well, too? If we weren't doing what was right in the Lord's sight, you think the devil would waste his time to cause so many problems and difficulties to come upon us? Of course not. Look at Job this whole quarter. In chapters 1 and 2, Satan tried to get God to give him permission to destroy Job. Well, if you take everything that he has, he'll curse you to his face, Satan said. And God said, you can take everything that he has in chapter 1, but you shall not touch him. Within just a moment, amount, within days, Job lost everything. But you know the one thing that he didn't lose, though? He didn't lose his faith and he retained his integrity. Even in the face of his wife and Satan working through his wife to try to get him to curse God and die. Sad situation. His life partner said, look, why do you retain your integrity? Curse God and die. He said, you speak like one of the foolish women. Shall we not receive good of the Lord as well as evil? And then in chapter 2, Job Satan goes before God again and says, Well, look, have you not con God, God says to Satan, Have you not considered my Job? That he's a righteous man and that there's not one like him in all the earth. Satan says, Well, skin for skin and flesh and bone for bone, touch him and he'll curse you to your face. And so God gave permission to Satan to afflict Job and to bring these boils upon him. But even in the midst of this, Job still didn't blame God for the difficulties that he's facing. And so you see, if ever we wonder why we're going through these difficulties and hardships, let us remember Job. Because compared to what Job went through, when we look at the difficulties and hardships that we faced in life, they're not really that bad off, are they? How many of us have lost 
everything within a matter of days. I don't think any of us sitting here have lost everything that we've had, children or anything, within a matter of days. How many of us have lost our health within a matter of days? Not that many, I would imagine. And so now let's take a look at Psalms chapter 4. And let's look at verses 4 to 6 in Psalms chapter 4. And then we're going to take a look at verse 8. And notice what David says to us, starting with verse 4. He says, stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Put your trust in the Lord. And that's where our trust really needs to be in these last days of earth's history that we're living in, is we need to place implicit trust in Jesus like never before and believe that he is faithful who is promised. And who is also promised that he that has begun a good work in us will continue it all the way to the very end, so the second coming of Jesus, if we do our part by allowing Jesus to perfect his character in us. There is something that we have to do, and that is, is we have to be willing to allow God to perfect his character. <coughs> if we're not willing, he can't force us. We have the free will to choose, so we have to be willing to trust in the Lord and allow him to have his perfect way in our lives at all times, even when we don't understand. It's better to trust in the Lord than to seek to go our own way. And it continues on in verse 6. He said, There be many that say, Who shall so show us any good? And notice what David says. He said, Lord, look up thy light upon, and the light of thy countenance upon us. And then verse 8, look what he says. Such a reassuring promise in Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm chapter 4, verse 8. David said, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. No matter what we go through, God is going to go through it with us. And it is so much easier to bear the difficulties and hardships that we're facing in this life. With Jesus on our side, rather than trying to face it on our own. And just because we're facing hardships does not mean that we've committed some great sin against God or that we've committed the unpardonable sin, as some would try to say. You know, if we have friends like Job, who would need enemies? Man, I wouldn't want to have friends like that. But you know, how many times do we end up doing like Job's friends when we try to comfort those that are going through difficulties and hardships? Most of the time, what's the first thing that usually comes out of our mouth when somebody's facing something and a difficulty or if they're facing a very hard trying time or they've lost something or they've lost their job or they've lost their family or something happens, usually people want to say, oh, well, what did you do wrong? That's the very first thing that usually comes out of our mouths is, well, what did you do wrong? Sometimes... What a person did wrong is not what they need to be made aware of right then and there. Sometimes they just didn't need to know that they have a friend that's there for them that loves and cares about them. And that they can share their difficulties and whatever it is that they're facing with. And that they have an ear that they can pour their cares and concerns out upon without wondering if they're going to condemn them or if they're going to go and spread it abroad to everybody else. And you know... Jesus is that type of friend, but we also should be that type of friend because there's a saying, and I know you pretty much are all familiar with it, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. And when somebody is in a very trying situation, sometimes if we can't say something that's going to encourage them, it would be better just to keep silent rather than say something. Because even the Bible says that when a fool keeps silence, it's considered as wisdom to him. And so sometimes silence is eloquence and golden rather than a multitude of words. And look at what we're told here in the spirit of prophecy. Well, this is actually Jeremiah 29, 11. Then we'll look at it quote in the spirit of prophecy. But if ever we doubted that God only intended evil to come upon us. Look what he tells us. Before we read this verse, can God lie? 
No, of course not. God cannot lie. He can only speak the truth. So when he said this right here in Jeremiah 29, 11, when he said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end, he meant exactly what he said. He is there to encourage, to strengthen us, and to help us to make it all the way through to the end if we'll just hold on to Jesus. And look at what we're told in the spirit of prophecy right here. This is from Desire of Ages. It says, Though our trial, through our trials, we have a never-failing helper. He does not leave us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with the evil, and be finally crushed with burdens and sorrow. Though now he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, Fear not, I am with thee. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 1.18 I have endured your sorrows, experienced your struggles, and counted your temptations. I know your tears, Jesus says. I also have wept. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into human ear, any human ear, I know. So Jesus knows. He understands the difficulties that we are going through. And he is there and he wants to encourage us and strengthen us if we will just continue to look to him and allow him to have his perfect way in our lives. And now let's turn our Bibles to Psalm chapter 23. This is actually my personally my favorite psalm in the out of all of them. And it's such a reassuring promise in Psalms chapter 23 because we all face difficulties. There's not, by matter of fact, is there anybody in here today that's not facing some type of difficulty or hardship in their life? I would imagine not. We all are facing some type of difficulty and hardship in our lives. But the good news is, is that Jesus is not going to leave us alone to face it by ourselves. And we need not go through it by ourselves. All we have to do is look to Jesus, and he will see us through the storm. And so, in Psalm chapter 23, we read that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, shall, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And look at what David tells us in verse 4. David faced a lot of difficulties and hardships in his life. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He didn't say I would not fear some. He said I will fear no evil. And why could David say he would fear no evil? Look at what he says in the rest of verse 4. He says, For thou art with me. David knew that even through the difficulties and the hardships that he was facing in his life, that the Lord was there with him and that he was not. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Verse 5 says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And notice what else we're told in the spirit of prophecy. This also is from Desire of Ages. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken. Though your pain touch no responsive cord in any human heart, he tells us. On earth, look to me and live. The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, the Lord says. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. Isaiah 54, 10. We could spend not only all day, we could spend the whole rest of the coming week at looking at all the precious promises that God reassures us of how much he loves and cares about us. But for sake of time, we're not going to do that. But we're going to look at several of them. And I hope that all of us will be encouraged by these precious promises. Now let's turn to Psalms chapter 34, verse 19. Psalms chapter 34, verse 19. When we're all there, say amen. 
Psalm chapter 34, verse 19. And notice what else the word of the Lord says to us in Psalm 34, verse 19. It tells us, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of some of them, all of them. So, keep holding on to Jesus, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Because he promised us that he will never leave us, nor forsake us. And now let's take a look at another precious promise from the spirit of prophecy. We are told to keep our words, excuse me, our wants, our joys, our sorrows, our cares, our cares before God. We cannot burden him. We cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of our head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. James 5.11 His heart of love is touched by our sorrows, even by the utterance of them. So, do we think there's anything in this life that we're going through? that the Lord is not concerned about and that does not touch his heart of sympathy? If we do, banish such thoughts because such thoughts is not from the Lord. It is from the devil. And the devil would want us to think that God does not love us and care about us. If he did, why are all these things happening to you? Just like he did to Job and worked through Job's three friends to try and get Job to curse God and die. But Job never would do it. He complained about what he's going through but he never would sin against God. And sometimes we may complain about the difficulties and hardships that we're facing. But instead of complaining, you know what we should do? The Bible says, count it all joy and chains when we fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of our faith produces what? Patience. And when patience has had its good work, he says, it brings forth the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And it goes on to say, that take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up the world. He rules over all of the affairs of the universe. Nothing that any in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. So God wants us to be happy. God wants us to have peace and joy in this life. But we have to be willing to keep our focus on Jesus. And now let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. And when we all get there, let's say amen, okay? 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. And notice what Peter says to us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Actually, 5 to 9, excuse me. 7 to 9. 5, 7 to 9. Casting all our care upon him, for he cares for us. And he tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Do we think that the difficulties and hardships that we're facing in life, that we're the only ones facing these and that nobody else is going through any trials and tribulations in their life? Sometimes we do, and we think that we're the only ones that are facing difficulties and hardships in our life. But look what God tells us in verse 9. He says, Home you resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren which are in the world. So you see, we're not, on a, we're not the only ones facing difficulties in our lives. Every single one of us are facing some type of afflictions in our lives. And we're going to find out why God allows these afflictions to come upon us here in just a moment. Look what we're told here in Steps to Christ. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy, no cheer, no sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. 
He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalm 147, verse 3. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care and his watch care and not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. That is how much our Heavenly Father cares about each one of us individually, so much so that if we were the only one, he would have still sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins because that's how much we mean to him. So much so that he gave all of heaven when he gave Jesus to die on that cross for our sins. And so we need not think that God doesn't really <coughs> care about us because he does. And so now that we see that Jesus does truly care about us, we may be wondering, well, if Jesus really cares, then why are we facing all these things we're facing in life? Have we not all asked this question, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen to me? What have I done? Why are these things happening? Have we not all asked those questions? I'm pretty sure each and every one of us have asked those questions here, and I imagine there's not one of us that have not asked that question. And here we find the answer to the question, as well as some other verses in the Bible that we're going to look at. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be open for you. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. And then we read right here, it is true that disappointments will come. Tribulation we must expect, but we are to commit everything small and great to God. He does not become perplexed by the multiplicity of our grievances, nor over powered by the weight of our burdens. His watch care extends to every household and encircles every individual. He is earned in all our business and our sorrows. He marks every tear he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. All the afflictions and trials that befall us here are permitted to work out his purpose of love toward us. And so now let's turn our Bibles to James, not James, but turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4, and let's look at verses 12 and 13. And then we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 12 and 13, and then chapter 10. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 tells us, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And now let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Actually, chapter, yes, chapter 12 and chapter 13. And then we'll go to chapter 10. And so you see, the reason why we face these things that we face in life is because God sees something in us worth perfecting. Like I said before, if he didn't see anything in us worth perfecting, he wouldn't waste his time on us. And God doesn't create any junk. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1.31, at the end of the creation, including mankind, it says, the Lord seen everything he made, and behold, it was very good. So God was well pleased in what he had done. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it tells us right here that let us run the, with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And Hebrews 13 tells us in verse 1, I will never leave you nor forsake you, the Lord tells us. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 39, we read, Cast not away therefore your confidence which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will not, shall come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. 
But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw, who draw back unto perdition, but unto them that believe to the saving of the soul. So just hold on a little longer, because soon Jesus is coming back. And he's going to give a crown of life to all who remain faithful to him all the way to the end. And Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 and 16 tells us this. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should have not have compassion on the son of her womb? The Lord says, yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. And as long as we continue to hold on to Jesus, we have this precious promise right here, and with this we're going to close, that someday soon, it tells us in Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Look at this here. We wonder if we're going to remember anything in this life. Look at what the Bible tells us right here. The former things are passed away. The things that we've gone through, the difficulties, the trials, the hardships, the afflictions, whatever we face in this life, as long as we remain faithful to Jesus, when we finally make it to that celestial shore and we see him who loves us and died for us on that cross, we can try our hardest to recall the difficulties and the trials that we've gone through in this life. And you know what we'll be able to say? We won't be able to remember anything that we've gone through in this life. And we'll say that heaven is cheap enough. It is cheap enough. Because there is nothing in comparison that we go through in this life to the glory that's going to be revealed in us at the second coming of Christ and the ceaseless ages of eternity as we walk and talk with our blessed Creator and Redeemer. So my brothers and sisters, when the devil tries to tell us God does not care, don't believe it because He does care. Look to Calvary if ever we doubt that Jesus loves and cares about us. So Jude tells us also in verse 24 that now to him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And no matter what we're facing in this life, God is there for us. He's not going to leave us alone. Continue, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to look to Jesus and hold on to him. No matter what you're facing, don't let go because he is going to return for us soon. And let us keep running the race with endurance. So let us, those that are willing and able to kneel, let us kneel and pray, okay? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the reassuring promise that you do truly love us and that you do care about us. And Lord, if there's any here present at the sound of my voice that has any doubt, are wondering whether or not you really truly care about them. We pray, Lord, that you'll banish all that doubt in wondering as to whether or not you really love or care about them. And we pray, Father, that you'll reveal to every one of us in a way that we've never imagined before just how much you truly love and care about us. Be with all of us as we go our separate ways and help us to continue to remember that this is the Sabbath and to keep the Sabbath holy according to the commandment and to do that which is pleasing in your sight, and not to seek to do our own pleasure during these sacred hours. Bless everyone, Lord, and keep us near to your side, and help us to continue to look to Jesus. In Jesus' name, we thank you and pray. Amen.